tell me, listen to me real good. I've told you once, I said it a thousand times. You get out of those pagan, satanic, religious, Christian churches. Christians do not follow the commandments of the Bible. Christians do what they want to do. They make up their own laws, their own rules, and their own regulations. Come out of her, my people, and come out from among them. And it's real simple and easy to ascertain who are these people you need to come out from. Easy. Number one, if they keep Sunday, that's an automatic sign that you need to not have any fellowship with these commandment-breaking, wicked deceivers and seducers and bewitchers of the truth. Simple. Glory to the King. Well, I hope you all had a blessed and rest Sabbath Shabbat today. Um, I know we did. We always do here at Straightway because we're always looking for the Sabbath day to come because uh, we just get it done during the week and looking for that day of rest that Yah provided for us. And, and of course, we always get fed super well today. And I'll tell you what, uh, the way Pastor brought it out today, um, talking about the curses, what it really means to curse somebody outside of what we've learned in the world and through Christianity and the other false doctrines out there. I mean, it was an exceptional, marvelous, um, wonderful, uh, you know, look at what is the truth and, and what the lie really is. I mean, and that's, that's a message that definitely is one to be listened to, like they all are again and again over and over. And then next time you get these people that are um, challenged like that and deceived and um, believing false doctrine, hey, you have the answers right there. Hallelujah to the King. Well, um, tonight, um, I had a few different directions I was going to go tonight, and I kind of got this put in my spirit tonight to go this direction. So I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, the workings of disunity. The workings of disunity, because uh, the reason is because in order for us to be a people of power and strength, we have to show a oneness and resolve to, uh, with, you know, uphold that strength of the unity. Uh, it, it reminds me of verse in, in Daniel chapter 12, um, where yeah, the man of sin, or you know, that king, um, that talks about in Daniel chapter 11, he, he sought to scatter the power of the holy people, and our power is, you know, not only in the Holy Spirit, of course, but it's also in our unity in showing to uh, all the other nations that we are of one people, one accord, one mind, one thought, and more importantly, one spirit. So um, what we're going to learn about tonight and look into, again, only uh, briefly because it's a pretty large topic, is is how the spirit of disunity, how it works, where it creeps in either subtly or you know just clearly in the open. But the fact of the matter is, um, these workings of disunity are there to obviously divide the body, to weaken us as a people, and ultimately sometimes actually remove or take away those that are still weak in the faith. Um, so that's what we're going to start with tonight. Again, up front, thank you, Brother Ugly, as always, for being our faithful poster and, and um, you know posting the scriptures and, and the, uh, the definitions. Appreciate that again. Uh, and all my faithful brothers and sisters, or listening in tonight, and the guests. Hallelujah. I uh, hope we're all edified, and with that, we're going to get started. All right, the workings of disunity. All right, I got a few things listed here after I was meditating on it that um, you can kind of tell uh, where there's a, a spirit of disunity going on. Maybe sometimes you can't recognize it up front, but you can still get a, a discernment. There's something going on behind the scenes, and it's there to work disunity. Uh, like I said, I got a few things, like 10, 15 things here that I um, just wrote down quick. But um, the workings of disunity of those that walk in fences, um, they're self promoting, they break continuity, of course. This spirit has the appearance of being on board when it really isn't, kind of like flying under the radar. It's discontented or not content. It operates under the influence of jealousy and envy quite often. It's looking to be heard and recognized. It's not in agreement with the whole, thus the disunity. 
or prolong its own way of thinking above the established rule, showing itself to be something when it's nothing. We'll agree to something, but over time we'll go against that agreement, meaning up front it says yay and amen, and then later on down the road you're going to find that it's actually opposing the thing that it testified to or agreed to. It's full of excuses. You know, oftentimes when it's, there's an inquiry made, it, it, it turns around and answers with excuses trying to justify uh, its workings. It promotes its own doctrine. It possesses a critical and a sarcastic spirit. And we're going to look on that. It's better known today as those that have that mocking, scorning spirit. Um, you find out they often murmur and complain, more so behind uh, closed doors or those that have the same familiar spirit. Um, it seeks to change the mind of men by offering its own opinion, you know, introducing something new to distract and pull away from the truth. Um, it makes disparaging comments hidden in humor or laughter. You know, make an offhand and trying to plant a seed, but disguising it in, in some subtle laughter or just like laughing it off. And but actually, the the, the promotion behind it is the the message behind it is that there's something they're in disagreement with. Um, it doesn't work well with others. Often distracts from the work at hand, disrupts the unity within a working group. Um, the word disunity. Uh, you won't find it in the, in the Bible per se, verbatim, the word disunity. But, I, of course, I got my faithful Oxford English Dictionary, um, 1919 version, so I went and looked in there, and I think they gave a pretty good list. It, it's pretty sound. Um, it really doesn't leave any room for speculation, but here's what they had. Disunity means a disagreement and a conflict within a group. It's a lack of accord. So they actually talk about um, it's a lack of accord. All these words that you're going to find out, uh, the, synonyms that gonna, the synonyms that I'm going to read are actually, um, a lot of them come out of our King James English understanding here. And the synonyms are disagreement, um, dissent, which is also a form of excuse making, um, dissension, arguments, conflict, strife, friction, discord, discordance, um, disaccord, disharmony, dissent, division, infighting, schism, variance, war, warfare. And again, on that list, I'm sure there's a lot of words that you recognize that are um, in our Bibles, in our King James, um, especially. All right, starting out, Psalms 133, verses 1 through 3. We're going to break this down a little bit. Psalms 133, 1 through 3. And of course, this is King David or Dawid, as some prefer to pronounce it in more of the Hebrew uh, wordage. All right, a song degrees of David. Behold, you know, take note, um, you know, uh, see uh, how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in union. So David said, look, you know, take a look out here, see how powerful it is, how good, um, what the strength is. How beautiful this looks when when brethren you know dwell together in oneness or in unity, and then he goes on to describe it as he sees it. It's like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his garment, as the dew of Hermon and the dew that descended upon the mountain of Zion. For there the Master commanded the blessing, Yahweh commanded the blessing, even life evermore. So he's likening to um, the good and pleasant unity of the brethren is, uh, in fact, is life and evermore. Okay, it's, it's a good thing. It, it's something that genders to life. All right, the word dwell, uh, as used in verse one, it's the Hebrew thirty-four twenty-seven, thirty-four twenty-seven. And this is out of Strong's. It means properly to sit down. So how good it is for brethren to sit down together in unity or be in, uh, together in one mind, um, specifically as judge and ambush and quiet, by implication to dwell, to remain, causatively to settle. Uh, it also means to marry, um, abide, continue, cause to make, dwell, e self, endure, establish, fail, habitation, haunt, um, to make, inhabit, make to keep, lurking, and uh, place, remain, return, seat, set. So basically, um, it's just the ability to sit together. 
in agreement. All right, unity. The word unity, the Hebrew 31, 62, again, looking at verse 1. Is the, yeah, Hebrew 31, 62, it's Yaakad. It's from the Hebrew 31, 61. It's properly a unit that is unitedly alike at all once, both likewise only all together with all. So one is sitting down together in one mind, one accord, one thought, one vision, one spirit. And again, it's from the Hebrew 31, 61, and that's Yaakad, and that means to, to become one to join, to unite. So, you know, it is good and pleasant for brethren to dwell together in unity. It actually, it displays such an atmosphere of peace and, and harmony. And everyone joined together in one mind, one accord, all in one agreement. Uh, but the problem is be, because men forget the devices and tools of the devil. Um, oftentimes, you know, the workings of disunity manifest, manifest themselves all too often. And that's what we're going to look at, these manifestations, so we can clearly see the workings behind the spirit of disunity. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10 and 11. 1 Corinthians 1, 10 and 11. And these are the, uh, the admonishment of Paul, the words of the apostle Shaul, speaking from um, the letters, specifically the one he wrote to the church at Corinth. And Paul says, like David, I beseech you, brother, you know, Behold, look, I beseech you, brother, hearken, listen to what I have to say. By the name of our Master, Yeshua, Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing. Well, why is Paul imploring in, in, in on the, you know, implying and, and saying and, and um, exhorting to the church of Corinth that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind, and in the same judgment. I mean, these are words of admonishment. And why is Paul actually having to say that? Because we find out in the next verse, for it hath been declared unto me of you, Paul's hearing these things, coming back to him, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. So Paul is finding out that he's hearing from the house of Chloe that they've got these contentions going on within the body. And, and what is happening, Paul already knows what's happening, so he writes the letter that, you know, you all be, speak the same thing. He, he's able to identify the things that actually cause for disunity. He knows that they're not speaking the same thing. Um, he knows that they're not joined together in the same mind, perfectly joined, um, and in the same judgment. And because of all these things, in comes that spirit of disunity, that working of disunity, and that's what's causing the division. The word division, the Greek 4978. Schisma. And this is from the Greek 4977. It's a split or a gap. Literally or frequently, division, rent, schism. So we actually, that there be no gaps among you, no splits among you, no schisms among you, no renting among you. Anything that would cause a disunit, uh, disunification. And from the Greek 4977, apparently, uh, verbal form, primary verb, to split or sever, literally or figuratively, break and divide, open, rend, make and rend. So these contentions that are happening are actually breaking down the structure of the body, actually uh, uh, dividing the unity of the fellowship. And the word contention, as Paul used in verse 11, is the Greek 2054, aris, of insert to quarrel. That is wrangling, contention, debate, strife, variance. All these ridiculous things um, that that actually transpire because a lot of times people leave the integrity of the word, the truth of the word, and start speaking from their own experiences, on their own personal revelations, whatever have you. All right, Proverbs eighteen nineteen. Still talking about contentions and and the uh, devastation that this type of atmosphere, this type of carnal mindset produces these contentions. Proverbs 18, 19. A brother offended. Now, this is a brother. A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city, and their contentions are like the bars of a castle. I mean, you understand when somebody's offended, they actually believe they're, they're right in their offense, 
they see from a view a, a viewpoint that um, they actually are justified in the way they're looking at a certain situation. They perceive it a certain way, and their contentions are, are their arguments or their debates or whatever are going to be the focus coming off of whatever that offense is, if that makes sense. So, I mean, that's where the direction is going to focus at. And, and the thing that says it's harder than one, it's harder to be one than a strong city, simply saying that there's nothing that can be said or anything that you can offer is a ransom to actually try to convince somebody that they're walking in a fence when they are are in this way. And again, the, this working of disunity, of course, is by the contention. So automatically, when somebody's contentious, um, you better have your ears up because there's um, a, a working of disunity going on in the body. All right, the word contention, working, or I mean, word contention in this uh, Proverbs 18:19 is the Hebrew 40:79. And I can actually get this midyan. Um, it's a variation of the Hebrew 4066. It means brawling, contentious, argumentative, debative, um, that that sort of thing. And that's all because of pride. Matthew 24 verses 8 through 10. Matthew 24 verses 8 through 10. We're going to look at a little bit more of offenses and the contentions behind them. And what the result is. Matthew 24, verses 8 through 10. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Okay, Jesus just listed off a whole bunch of stuff that um, you need to go back and read if you're, if you're unfamiliar with it. And he goes to verse 9. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then many shall be offended. Because of why? Because the, the name of Yahshua Jesus, who you represent. And shall betray one another. And shall hate one another. Right there because of the offense. And this isn't just, um, you know, defined to um, natural family or the other nations. This is with, actually within our nation itself. Because of an offense, there is betrayal. And that's, again, causing division and the breakdown and the unity because they're under the spirit, an offended spirit. Mark chapter 14, verses 27 to 31. Mark 14, 27 to 31. Again, talking about the workings of disunity. And how about when, when somebody's offended that they'll actually... Um, for whatever reason, they'll actually um, cause a disunity in the body and themselves become divided or removed from the body. And Jesus saith unto them, All ye shall be offended. I mean, he already knew. Of course, he's the Messiah, he's the King, he's, he's Yah manifest in the flesh. He already knew that they would be offended because of him, because of me this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. I mean, so much for the oneness anymore because something come in something that would challenge these hardcore apostles the disciples and all of a sudden because of that because they were offended about what was about to happen they actually their unity broke down and they scattered but after that I am risen I will go before you into Galilee but Peter said to him although all shall be offended yet will not I and Jesus saying unto him, Verily I send thee that this day, even this night, before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me three times. Already knowing that Peter is going to dissimulate because of offense, because of fear, uh, because they didn't, they, they didn't want to be identified with the Messiah because um, he was actually laid out there as, you know, as a shame before the other nations and before um, the wicked Jews. All right, John chapter 6, verses 60 through 66. Many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear? Here comes the offense again. Something was presented. They couldn't handle it. They didn't have the concept. They couldn't grasp 
what was being said because of something that was already in them, um, some, some doctrine, some tradition, some type of carnal mindset rather than some natural understanding rather than a spiritual understanding. So um, they just heard the Messiah speak and they said, you know, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew it himself that his disciples murmured at it, again, here comes the murmuring and complaining. You see the avenue, you see the breakdown. First the offenses, then comes the murmuring, the contentions between them, the debating, the murmuring, the complaining, that his disciples murmured at it. He said unto them, does this offend you? I mean, does this trip you up? Does this, what I said, cause you to stumble? Does it challenge your regular thinking? Jesus said, What and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the Spirit that quickeneth the flesh profit nothing. So the Messiah is already telling them that, look, the reason these people are offended, and if they were standing there, it's because um, you're trying to get this in the flesh and not through the Spirit. The Spirit is the one that actually opens up the understanding. The words that I speak unto you, they are Spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who, of course, are the ones that were going to betray him, the unbelievers. They were there. They were presenting themselves as one of his. But the Messiah already already knows who's his and who aren't, even though they're all there, okay? And he knew that the ones that believed not or weren't fully committed um, or didn't trust in him, or that uh, walked after the natural understanding, would betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of the Father, meaning the ones that are truly going to believe and accept and hear are the ones that were actually came to me um, by the Father, not just showed up and said that this is a good thing, I want to do this. From that time, many of his disciples went back. They broke unity, they broke rank, they divided themselves from the body, and walk no more with him because of what? Because right way back they stumbled at the Messiah's words. They, they allowed an offense to come in. They got contentious, murmured, complained, and actually uh, took them out. If I remember right, another comment says that you know there was 70 that went out and only the 12 remained. Um, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14. Hebrews 12, 14 through... 14 and 15. Again, talking about the workings of disunity. The writer says, Follow peace with all men and holiness. So these are the two required, the two main things, without which no man shall see the master. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of Yah, lest any root of bitterness spring up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. This just isn't, um, you know, the the uh, problem of one person, this root of bitterness, when it affects one, that root is there designed to grow up and actually spread out and cause others to trouble and be defiled. So how does the root of bitterness spring up when men how does it spring up when men do not follow those things which bring peace and holiness? Without peace and holiness no man can or will see Christ in you. The word bitterness on the fifteenth verse is the Greek forty eighty eight. It's from the Greek forty nine as acridity, especially poison. Literally or figuratively bitterness. So it's something that's very acrid, something that's poisonous. Um, and it's from the 48 or 9 through the idea of piercing sharp that is acrid, literally bitter something that's sharp, pungent um, something that's um, out there to poison others it actually has a a very um, how do you want to put that a sharp attack. And the word bitter. Well, let me see. I believe I got this from the definition from my Oxford Dictionary. The word bitter here, 
um, means tasting like wormwood and quinine, opposite to the sweet, um, unpalatable to the mind, full of affliction. These are all words to do with bitterness. They mean something that's bitter, um, full of affliction, violent, relentless, biting harsh, piercingly cold. And the word troubled, the Greek 1776, um, again, as I'm using verse 15, means to um, crowd in, that is to annoy or trouble. So again, you have somebody that it allows the spirit, uh, the root of bitterness to come in for whatever reason. Um, they see something out of an evil eye, here comes this bitterness, and of course, this root of bitterness spreads out. This this, this plant, this, this uh, you know, this vine spreads out, and it's going out there to um, grab hold of others to entangle them in the, the cause of its bitterness, trying to thereby defile money and of course breaking down the unity of the body. Proverbs six verses twelve through Proverbs six twelve through. 15. All right. A naughty person. Okay, we're going to look at the characteristics of a naughty person. This is actually somebody, when you listen to the uh, words that um, Solomon used here, you'll find out this is somebody more or less, he does thing, things covertly, sneakily, you know, and, and um, behind the scenes, operating under the radar to actually cause these types of, you know, a dis, uh, disunity in the body, a division. Um, and, and pay close attention because here it gives you a lot of good indications, a lot of clear manifestations of what to look for. I'll be careful. I mean, you know, I'm, what I'm not advocating is everybody that does, you know, whatever it is I'm about to describe here is actually working in operating or trying to walk in the spirit of disunity it's just that your radar should be up and you should be aware we can't allow ourselves to fall into you know uh, deep suspicion and you know ultimately accusations but these are just um you know how to keep your spiritual eye open okay and again the pastor said it before and it's right we're not out there trying to always you know con continually you know discern evil on everybody but the fact of the matter is Evil is there, and we have to be have to watch. We have to be sober and watch. Proverbs six twelve: A naughty person, a wicked man, walketh with a forward mouth. We're going to break this verse down a little bit because there's a lot here. Now the word naughty is in a naughty person is the Hebrew eleven hundred one one zero zero. Belly yahel. And it's from Hebrew 1097 and 3276. It means without pers without profit. Basically, something that has no fruit, that adds nothing. So we have somebody that, a, a, a person without profit, a wicked man, worthlessness, by extension, destructive, wickedness. Um, so, we're, again, the focus is on somebody that has no profit, has no fruit, adds nothing. So it, it, it's somebody that is a pretender that's there, but they're operating in, in, in the uh, capacity of making others believe that they're actually a part of the body. I mean, uh, I mean, normally people don't pop my mind, but this just didn't. I'll just offer it. You remember, uh, what's his name up there from Canada, Dave Thompson? I mean, uh, this is basically somebody that uh, this fits very well because... The whole time he was with us, um, spiritually, I don't know if he ever added anything. I mean, he did a little bit of labors when he was here, but as the spirit, this whatever, this bitterness that crept into him began to get deeper and deeper, you can see there's actually no profit at all. He added nothing. He actually was trying to take away and destroy the unity with with his own bitterness. But anyway, a wicked man walketh with a forward mouth. Um, so we have a naughty person, a wicked man walketh with a forward mouth. The word forward is a perversity from the Hebrew 6141. It's basically a perverse mouth. And that's a, um, again, from the Hebrew 6141, which distorted, hence false,
crooked, forward, perverse. So we have somebody that walks with a, uh, a, a false speech, false words. Um, and from the Hebrews 61.40, to not or distort, figurative to pervert, act or declare perverse, make crooked, prove that is perverse. So they're actually there to pervert something, to represent something other than what it is, to try to skew something for whatever advantage sake they can gain from it, whatever they can do to um, accomplish their own agenda. Verse 13, he winketh with his eyes. This again is the naughty person, the wicked man that has the perverse or crooked or false mouth or speech. He winketh with his eyes, he speaketh with his feet, he teaches with his fingers. So actually what Solomon is, is, is telling us, these are the telltale signs that you can tell somebody that has a um, unprofitable spirit that is a wicked person that is walking in with a false mouth or speech or doctrine. These are the these are the things to help identify. Uh, it's clearly right here what you're dealing with. It says he winketh with the eyes, he speaketh with his feet, he teacheth with his fingers. So what's this mean? Well, the winketh is the, is the Hebrew seventy one sixty nine. It's karats, or something like that, pronounced sort of like that. It means to pinch. All right, that is, now pay attention to this next one. It means to bite the lips. We're talking somebody that winks with his eyes. This is another manifestation of this part of the sentence. Blink the eyes as a gesture of malice. Oftentimes, you know, we've seen people blink with one eye. It's like, yeah, you know, you're with me. Um, you know, you, you understand where I'm going. Um, or I'm just gaming you, I'm playing with you, whatever people wink with the eye. To squeeze off a piece of clay in order to mold it, mold a vessel from it, form, move, wink. Um, so we have two little gestures here. We have first just generally to blank the eyes or blank one eye or wink with the eye. But the other one that's really interesting, like it's just brought up, was to bite the lips. How many people can you think of that you actually see them walking, uh, you know, you, maybe at work or maybe hopefully not, but a brother or sister in the ministry, that you know that you'll actually see them biting the lip. If they chew on their lip, bite the lip, especially in an uncomfortable situation, um, something where um, they, they feel they've been found out or discovered something going on behind the scenes, you know, inventing and promoting something. And I've seen this manifestation on several occasions, and it usually turned out not to be too good. All right, speaks with the feet, um, exhibits fits and temper tantrums, stops potholes, and the pastors talked about that for years, people that manifest the, you know, you see some people because they're all fit and they're having temper tantrum and they're all discouraged and mad about something, basically, you know, walking down the feet and planting their feet hard on the soil, basically, you know, stopping potholes in the pavement. Um Vents his frustration as he, he speaks with his feet and makes his rounds. Have to be a part of every conversation. Will invite themselves in and take over. You know, this is somebody that um, operating in this capacity. Oh, pastor's up here, so. Sorry. <laughs> You're all right, Pastor Shalom. But he, uh, you know, speaks with the feet, meaning that. Um, you know, he, he, he uh, not only is it showing his anger, his frustration, or his dismay or disapproval of whatever the case may be that actually causes this person, this naughty person, this wicked man, to, uh, you know, send a message by actually uh, physically stomping his feet or, or whatever the case or, you know, planning him hard as he walks away in disapproval, but it's also in, in a more op secret operative way is somebody that, you know, uses their feet to go from one place to the next to the next to be able to plant certain uh, information, whatever it may be. Most of the time it's it's information, self-centered information. I mean, you've been having a conversation before, there's two of you, and here comes somebody that walks with his feet, right? You know, you're having a good, hearty conversation. Somebody will walk up there, stand there, and all of a sudden try to take over the conversation. How often has that happened to you before? I mean, if you think about it, you know, so just beware, because there's a reason, there's a drive and a motivation for this. 
All right, teaches with the fingers. Um, these are manifestations that you can watch for. You know, they ball up the fist. You know, they, they put out that index finger to shake it, trying to get the point across. Um, lay hands on it appropriately. Um, you know, use a great deal of hand motion to illustrate his point, their point. Um, and, of course, when people teach, you understand that teaching is a promotion of an idea of revelation or doctrine. So if what I'm saying is making sense, as they try to promote or whatever it is, whatever their stance, their circumstances try to draw attention to themselves. Remember, we're dealing with a naughty and wicked person that ultimately by walking in this capacity is there to cause disunity in the body. So um, these are just telltale signs that to be careful of. Is it always the case? No, not ever, but um, not always, I should say, but it, it's something that walks for. You know, and, and a lot of people get just overly animated with stuff and they actually the animation is distracting you from the words that are actually could be coming out of their mouth and uh, you know when I said they lay, lay hands on inappropriately I mean the Bible says to lay hands on no man suddenly and I've had in the past people actually restrain me physically um, grabbing me so they can actually tell me what it is they think they, that I need to hear I mean hold them until they get done speaking to me now that is uh, a very uncomfortable place to be. Proverbs continue on, verse 14. Frowardness is in his heart. Remember, we co we copied that, or we covered that. Excuse me. That means perversity or falsity is in his heart. He devises mischief continually. He soweth discord. We've been hearing about that the last couple weeks, haven't we? Um, that's a sort of a strife. And verse 15. Therefore shall his calamity come suddenly. Suddenly shall it be broken without remedy. There is going to be no recourse because a, a, a wicked man, uh, a naughty man, can only continue for so long before these things finally come to an end and the, the uh, hammer comes down, so to speak. Um, the word calamity is the Hebrew 3, 343. Uh, it's pronounced had. And it means oppression by implication, misfortune, ruin, calamity, destruction. So when somebody's calamity comes suddenly, their misfortune comes, their ruin, um, all because of what pattern they're walking after, how they're conducting themselves. And they finally get caught. How are you? I just do I even did my step to know how. Proverbs 16, verse 28 to 30. Proverbs 16, 28 to 30. A forward man so a strife, and a whisper separated chief friends. So we're, we're talking about a perverse man, a false man. He so a strife. Back to the contentions again. Somebody that's continually contentious. And Pastor talked about the sowing and reaping a couple a uh, couple weeks ago. Beautiful message. And a whisper. Um, separated or causes disunity among chief friends. It, I mean, you can actually plant something that's so powerful um, uh, by whispering or by coming silently or in stealth and actually speaking words that you can separate those that are very close together. That's how powerful and deceptive this thing is to even take away those that are you know, firmly round, rooted and, uh, and grounded so be careful. I mean, the, the Bible talks about, Jesus talks about that if it were possible, that they would deceive even the very elect. Well, here we have the case of the whisper um, causing separation between very close friends just because he's whispering. And this, again, is coming from somebody with a perverse, um, strifeful type of spirit and, and uh, attitude. A violent man entices, or that persuades his neighbor, and leadeth him into a way that is not good. Verse 30, he shutteth his eyes to devise. That means he, he shuts his eyes uh, to plan, to fabricate, to plot these perverse things, these forward things. Moving his lips, he bringeth evil to pass. So there's actually a concerted effort in the mind. Um, it may not be a, a conscious or subconscious effort, but there, there's something going on in the reason this whisper is going about this this man that's sowing strife. And of course he does it by moving his lips. He brings these evil things to pass. 
the word whisper, we're going to break this down a little bit. Um, it means, it's the Hebrew 5372, it's a slanderer. So the slanderer, the talebearer, the whisperer separates chief friends. A false report maliciously uttered to a person's injury, uttering of such reports, false oral defamation. I mean, and first of all, especially, you know, that brings up a point. I, I've actually had to deal with this in the past, and it's actually, you know, to the point of being offensive where people will actually pastor, you know, they'll follow pastor for a while, then all for some reason they'll start questioning his character, okay? And, and, and the reason is because there's something that entered in, something that they didn't approve of. Now, he was fine up until then. He was the one that the, the Most High brought him to because Yah know you know because they're the ones that say they're declaring that Pastor Dow was speaking you know uh, by the voice of the Most High. He, he is an anointed vessel, and yet they lose their testimony all of a sudden when this offense comes in. All right, and then it's gone out the window. So where did their testimony go? And the word violent, a violent man, as we talked about in verse 29, is a by implication, wrong, violence. It's the Hebrew 2555, excuse me, brother, I believe 2555. It's from 2554, violence, by implication, wrong, um, unjust gain, cruel, um, damage, false, injustice, unrighteous, violence, violence against, wrongdoing. So we have somebody that's a wrong man, that, that, that is a wrongdoer, it's unrighteous man persuades his neighbor, entices him. From the Greek 2554, kamas, a primitive root to be violent by implication to maltreat. You know, we're still de dealing with the word violent, the violent man, one that maltreats. Make bear, shake off, violate, do violence, take away violent wrong, imagine wrongfully. And the word shuts. So as he shutteth his eyes, um, is the Hebrew 6095, um, properly to fasten or make firm. That is, close the eyes, shut. So to make firm, they're actually uh, um, they're going to make this plot. This, as it said, he shutteth his eyes to devise, plot, plan, and fabricate forward things. He's actually thinking and meditating on these things. And fastening his thought on making these things come to pass. All right. Um, now this portion of it I titled Disuniting with the Ununited, meaning that we actually have instances in the Bible where we're actually commanded that those that are causing uh, the disunity are working to cause disunity. Um, we, we have commands, we have direction, we have instruction that we are to ununite ourselves with those that are actually causing this for the preservation of the whole. And we're going to go over them here a little bit. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, um, up to verse 6, up to verse 15. Second, second, second Thessalonians 3, 6 through 15. Now we command you, brethren, this is a command for the brethren, in the name of our Master Yeshua, Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourself. This is actually a command from the Apostle Paul to the church at Thessalonica, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that does what? Walks disorderly. And Paul is going to define for us how a brother, what it means for a brother or a sister to walk disorderly and not after the tradition which he received of us, something that he already knows that he or she already knows that they're supposed to be doing, but they're not doing it because this is bringing in a spirit of disunity amongst the whole. And we're going to find out how that's going to happen. Verse 7, For you, you yourselves know how we ought to follow us. For we have behaved not ourselves disorderly. I'm going to be talking about the ones in the headship positions, the ones that are the elders, the leaders, the teachers, um, they actually presented themselves as examples 
of the right way of doing things, and they, they best prove that because um, they didn't behave themselves in a disorderly fashion when they were with the body of the saints. So that's what we need to look at. That's the focus and the attention. Verse 8, neither did we eat any man's bread for naught. I mean, just for no reason at all. We just didn't show up and decide we're just going to sit down and eat something. But they earned this. How did they earn this bread? But wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you. I mean, actually, could you imagine if, if uh, you know, say any of the, the heads of the fellowships or any of those that in the authority positions in uh, this ministry, whether it be Pastor Dahl or, you know, the other Pastor Corey, Pastor Fox, whoever, you know, if, if they just decided that they're going to show up in your area and they're going to abide in your home and then uh, while you're out there doing whatever it is that you're doing, trying to get it done, if they're just going to sit back and do nothing, well, yeah, it, it, I mean, that's going to cause somebody to stumble and ask questions. It, you know, it, I made a mistake years ago when I first got into um, this way of righteousness and holiness and, and the Israelite way. We are still calling ourselves, um, you know, the, the best form of Christians that we knew, but there was a pastor from another ministry that I used to follow that um, he actually came for a personal visit, him and his wife, and, you know, because of the false American humility and, and still being new to the word, you know, he was out there with us in the morning, like me and some other brothers. It was uh, it was like 10, 12 below us in the middle of winter in, in North Dakota near Bismarck. I mean, it was rough. And I see him coming out there, and I'm like, oh, Pastor, you know, that's all right. We got this covered, man, you know, trying to honor him. He's like, oh, no, uh-uh. <laughs> That's right, brother, ugly the piss is. But, but uh, you know, it's like because of the doctrine they had in me, I was trying to show him honor, saying, no, nah. but, you know, actually he already knew, of course, better what the Word said, and he didn't want to be chargeable to no man that he just laid around and did nothing. You know, so I actually learned a lot by that. It really helped open my eyes. But um, not because we have not power, not because they don't have the right or the authority or the ability to, to, you know, sustain or to keep back from actually jumping in there. But we make ourselves an examples unto you to follow us because, remember, we're talking about those that we're supposed to withdraw ourselves from because they walk disorderly. They're actually adding something um, negative to the whole. For even when we were with you, this we command you, that if any would work not, neither should, we, should he eat. At this, at, at straightway, and um, a great deal of you that are listening now uh, are familiar with what we do here. I mean, our custom here, away from the inception, when Pastor Dolph, you know, by by the leading of the Most High and the Holy Spirit, got this word going that um, we're a, a community that's um, centered and focused around full work days. When it's six days, you shall labor. We work six days. And we work from basically sun up to uh, a lot of times sundown. I mean, we, we pull back a little bit in the winter, um, but even after dinner, there's still chores to do and duties and responsibilities. So it's not like we, we can just work nine to five and we're done. This is our custom here. So when you see that, the example, uh, and, and you'll see that reflection, of course, in a lot of the other fellowships uh, of the ministry scattered around the United States. Just watch the videos. We'll visit. Um, and we all carry the same type of spirit. But this is what happens when we have those that don't because, uh, again, we have these examples in front of us, primarily Pastor Dowell. This is how he uh, he goes, and this is the reason he goes because he knows what the Bible says. Man, we got to get out there and get it done. Um, verse 11, For we hear that there are some... There's a few, not everybody, but there are some which walk among you disorderly. How do they walk disorderly? What is the reason for this disorder? But they conduct themselves in a disorderly way, working not at all, but are busybodies. All right, the word busybody, the Greek 4020, um, it means to work all around, that is, bustle about, be a busybody. And, and and again, I'm, I'm sure you've all seen demonstrations of this, whether it's on a secular job or um, if you um, you know, may have seen it here at the community, you yeah, forbid, but hey, it does happen. You have a bunch of brothers together. I mean, we are getting it done. 
Everybody knows their place, their position. The job is flowing well. We're working in a, a great accord, one unity. Uh, the atmosphere is wonderful. We're seeing the progress. And then in come one person, you know, just, just, just one. And he'll walk up, and, and he's not even part of the, the, the situation. And he'll decide that he's going to pull the brother aside and start talking to him, you know, who knows what, what color the moon was last night, whatever, uh, you know, whatever the reason. But the fact of the matter is, when, when people do this, they think they're justified. They think they're right. They, they don't see the vision of the whole. And then they, they see the breakdown in unity. Just, you know, it's the old proverbial cog in the gear. If one cog, one tooth breaks out of the, out of the gear, it disrupts the whole thing, you know. And we've had that happen here repeatedly over the years, and we've had some of the bad apples in the past, and it gets frustrating. Um, you know, I actually told a few uh, people that used to live here years ago, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that um, because you're at Straightway, I understand that, you know, that there's certain guidelines that we follow here, but I'll tell you what, if I was an employer out in the world, I'd have fired your ass already. And that, that, but we can't, you know, we, we just don't play that kind of way there like the world. We, we, we like to be long-suffering like our yacht. But, yeah, it is. So that is the example of somebody that's a busybody. They don't want to work. They want to be promoting their own agenda. They have their own things to talk about. Uh, they have their own uh, way of viewing or looking at things. Um, and it brings uh, a very uncomfortable and um, ununified spirit into the area. All right, verse 12. Now, that been under such, we command and exhort by our Master Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. And shut your mouth and get out there, get it done, so you can have something to eat. But you, brethren, be not weary in well-doing, knowing that these things are going to happen. What I just got done saying, that we keep, you know, because we are brethren, we just keep going. We don't grow weary when we see these displays, you know. Um, we just keep plowing, pressing forward. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, epistle, by this letter, note that man. And again, Paul says, have no company with him. For what reason? You exclude yourself, you remove yourself. And as somebody that has enough discernment and sense, it isn't so self-centered, they can actually, they'll actually feel ashamed and understand that, um, hey, you know, what is going on? Now, you know, another thing, we'll be all together working, and we have the same situation where we have, people already in the group and they're working together it seems like things when somebody will get spiritual or bring something up or start a conversation about you know did the Mets win the World Series you know whatever it can be stacking wood or whatever the case is and they'll stop what they're doing and then they want the person they're talking to to stop at the same time and it disrupts the flow again you know so commonly what I've learned is brother you can you can well it's fine you know there's no nothing to forbid you having a conversation but keep working while you're doing it can, can you keep Performing the same task so we can all get this done together. You know, many hands make light work. Um, you know, and again, I have my note here. Commanded separation. Actually, Paul, this is a commanded separation so somebody can actually come to the understanding of where they're falling short. This is a perfect illustration of what the Messiah said when he told the disciples that whatever judgment you meet out, it shall be meet back again to you. Such is the case with the busybody, one which disrupts the unity amongst the brethren and then finds themselves standing without and at least him questioning everyone else as though there was something wrong with him. And eventually he'll come across the fact that, man, what's going on? Why is everybody acting like that? In verse 15, last verse. Yet count him not as an enemy, he's not an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. So there's also things, not only that because you're withholding the company that he's going to cause the shame because, hey, it's, it's through the admonishment of somebody telling them, well, hey, brother, you know, well, hey, sister, come on now, you're breaking the ranks, you're causing uh, us to, uh, you know, operate in the spirit of disunity and a oneness. Our court isn't there. There's actually division going on. Even these subtle things. Let's see, I got 657. I'm going to go ahead and finish these two verses here, then we're going to take a break. All right, Romans chapter 16, verses 17 and 18. Again, talking about the workings of disunity, how to see them, understand them, identify them, the manifestations. Now I beseech you, brethren, 
Again, this is Paul. You know, I'm saying the brothers take note. Now, hear what I got to say. Mark them which cause divisions and offenses. Those that actually go about because they're they're actually causing a, a separation in the body, and they're actually promoting offenses, causing people to stumble, as we know what the word offense means. Contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. Again, it commanded separation. Avoid them, for they are, that are such. Paul's going to identify that the character of these that do that cause divisions and offenses. For they that are such serve not. They're not the servants of the Most High, our Master Jesus Christ, but they have another agenda, another promotion of their own self-promotion, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches, they deceive the hearts of the simple. Not the simple out in the world, because they're already deceived, talking about the, the hearts of the young babes in the Messiah. Because their words sound good, they may have some tenure, they may speak well. They may speak on a, you know, uh, with great swelling words that lure to the flesh, like I say, on a, on a college educated level. Hey, come on! The Messiah spoke to the common people um, clearly. Uh, he spoke to them in such a way that anybody, whoever it was, from a child to an old man, he covered all the range, the gamut of everybody in, in society. They could understand him plainly. They didn't have to have a, a you know, a, a um, Compton's Dictionary, or they didn't have to have their pocket thesaurus so they could break down some of these words, because sometimes the stuff gets, you know, it's so crazy that I don't know what, what the reason is. It's, it's, I don't know. Anyway, that, that's for another another blog talk. But, hey, uh, Saints, I hope you're enjoying this so far. And I'm going to go ahead, and we're going to take a short break because... I've got to get myself some water. So here is our ministry break. Be back in a minute. Shalom. This is Sister Wenda. I hope that all of you are enjoying this particular broadcast that you're listening to right now. We really appreciate each and every last one of you, our faithful listeners and supporters of the Straightway Truth Radio broadcast. We try to make sure we do our best to ensure that you have the best broadcast as well as the truth coming to you in the hour that we're living in right now. If you'd like to help us in this endeavor, your offering will be greatly appreciated in the work of the Ministry of the Most High Yah. Our mailing address for your gift, offering, or letter of support is Pastor Charles Dowell, Jr. That's Pastor Charles Dowell, Jr., 632 Highway 52, Bypass West. That's 632 Highway 52 Bypass West, PMB number 1, Lafayette, Tennessee. And Lafayette is spelled L-A-F-A-Y-E-T-T-E, Tennessee, 37083. If you would like to contact us by way of phone, the country code is 1, area code 615-688-688. 3025. You may leave a message there and be the Father's will. We will do whatever we can to return your message. It is our hope and our prayer that as you continue to listen to the Straightway Truth Ministry and as you apply the teachings of this ministry, that you are finding peace and growth within you, your family, and life as well. And do please tell others so that the truth may also have an impact and touch others' lives so that they may enjoy the benefits of the truth of Jesus Christ, just like we all are. Shalom, the King is coming. The King is coming, hallelujah. That is the truth, Sister Wanda. All right, back to the study again on the workings of disunity. The workings of disunity. Okay, going back, book, book, uh, 1 Timothy, the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 6. Verses 3 through 8, 1 Timothy 6, 3 through 8. We're taking more looks at how this spirit works, how these different spirits work to cause disunity, how they manifest themselves in, in the physical. All right, verse 3. If any man teach otherwise, and, and they teach otherwise in what? There's conditions that Paul is setting 
forth here, it is lettered as young Timothy. If any man teach otherwise, consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Master Jesus Christ, which of course is the wholesome words that Paul is talking about, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. You know, a wholesome word uh, is a word that's uncorrupted. It's a word that's safe, it's sound, it's the pure word. It's the word of the Messiah. He is proud, so Paul is going to identify the characteristics of somebody that will not consent to wholesome words, to sound words, to uncorrupted and safe words. Not words that are, um, not doctrines that are pulled in from um, other crazy avenues, from, uh, you know, the likings of other books and other writers. He is proud, he, knowing nothing. Even though it sounds like he knows something, he really knows nothing. But doting about questions. Um, doting about, the, the word doting means to hanker after, to harp after, to be driven to speak, uncontrolled impulses. You know, doting about, uh, just be driven to harp after, to, to hanker, to ask these questions, to present these questions. And strife of words, actually causing, again, remember the word strife, contention, all these things keep coming up, always in relationship to disunity. Whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmises, all these things are the byproducts or the fruit of somebody that's continually presenting, doting about, driving after, you know, uh, harping after, um, you know, being continually like, you know, the, the, the voice in your ear pushing certain doctrines, and out of all this stuff comes these envies and strife railings and evil surmisings. And already they've been identified because they can't um, consent or agree to speaking from wholesome words. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt mind. Now Paul's identifying that the character, these men are actually speaking from a corrupt mindset and destitute of the truth, supposing that Gain, so there's a reason that they're doing this. Gain is godliness, do what? From such withdraw thyself. Uh, of course, why withdraw yourself from such people? Um, you know, these people are not content. They have driven desires to teach and expound their own doctrines that go outside of sound, uncorrupted, safe doctrine. You know, they, they come up with something new, you know, a different revelation, a, a different presentation, a different interpretation of an established truth, and by allowing the words to be spoken amongst those who are sound will bring about all those things which will lead to disunity. You know, the strife, the envying, the railings, the evil suspicions, as, as Paul just wrote Timothy. These are all the, the, the result of these certain kind of men. Verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. So, so Paul is telling Timothy the reason that these people are actually motivated to go this direction, and, and because they are, because there's something in it for them, because they feed their own belly, you understand, um, it's because there's not a contentment. They don't know how to be content. They don't understand commitment and contentment. They have to have something, uh, what they believe to be more greater, more important, and more self-sufficient uh, or self-gratifying uh, than what is it means just to be content. But Paul says in, in six six that to Timothy, but godliness with contentment, that's the greatest gain there is, not showing how much you know or presenting how great you are or you know, whatever the case may be. This is the greatest gain there is just to learn to be content and be godly or live holy and righteously in that contentment. For we brought nothing into this world, uh, we came in empty. It is certain we can carry nothing out. It doesn't matter. Everything that we try to heap to ourselves, it isn't going with us. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. So, again, you're dealing with somebody that is um, an object of causing disunity. They're not content. They're not happy. They're not at peace with the situation, always trying to change something, inject something, add something, um, you know, to not it's, – it's also a form of control, all right? But again, the bottom line is it brings in the strife, the envyings, the jealousy, you know, the the, the railings, the evil, the evil uh, suspicions, 
you know, he's doing this, she's doing that, all because of this type of approach. But again, the bottom line that Paul said to Timothy, man, just be content. Just, just understand your place. Stay there. Be happy with it. God's got, in, in, you know, a man's gift shall make room for him. When it's time, um, then Yah will lift you up. You, every good and perfect gift descended from the Father you know, above and come down here for us, his saints. And when it's time, he will bring you farther along. Just be content. Be obedient servants. Jude chapter 1, 17 and 18. Jude 1, 17 and 18. But beloved, all right, my, my beloved, my brothers, my sisters, ones greatly loved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Master Jesus Christ. So these are the things that the apostles actually spoke and more than likely received them from the Master himself, Jesus Christ, while they were with him. How that they told you that there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after what? They're all ungodly lust. And we brought up mockers earlier. They're the ones that oftentimes you can identify a mocker with the little hints of sarcastic speech, the critical speech. Um, you know, they make a, uh, they scorn things. They put things down. The reason is because um, they like to be elevated. They like to have the preeminence. So you have to destroy the credibility of other things, no matter how simple they are, in order to actually put the focus back on you. So you be careful of these people that do that, these mockers that carry that mocking spirit, especially that critical, um, sarcastic uh, type of approach of things. Man, I tell you, I hear that just yeah, that just gets under my skin for some reason. I just don't do well with them, never have. But, I mean, that's to say that I'm so good that I can actually um, look down on everybody else. And that's a pretty sad situation if you ain't nobody to begin with. If that makes sense, you know. I mean, Yah help us. All right, three John, the third, third John, um, nine through eleven. Third John, nine through eleven. Oh, and this man has come up in a lot of conversations. Just, just an example for our learning. And I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes. Here we go, but Diotrephes, who loveth. So Paul is saying there. John is saying, man, I wrote unto the church, I wrote unto the assembly, something, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence, among them receiveth us not. He doesn't receive what they have to say. He doesn't receive the words of the authority, because why? He has, he has a promotion. He has an agenda. He wants to have the preeminence, whatever it takes to get there. Again, this preeminence is self-centered, selfish behavior, thinking himself to be something, not waiting for the Yah to actually put him in the place is causing a dissension in the body, causing a disunity. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds, which, because, hey, John's coming with it, you know, he's coming with a purpose. If he comes, he's going to let this man know that, man, he's not going to let this thing go unchallenged. I will remember his deeds, which he doeth, pratting against us with malicious words. Why? Why is he trying to do this? He's trying to tear down the authority. Well, let me tell you something. If you're ever in a situation where you have a brother or sister attacking, however subtly it is, however, you know, on the slight it is against um, Pastor Dow, the elders, those that Yah has ordained and put in this position, the heads of the communities, I mean, you either let them know right away that you're not going to deal with that jacked up spirit, you don't want to hear no part about it. Or just remove yourself, like the Bible says. You withdraw yourself because you will be sending a huge message. Do not allow yourself to be taken with them kind of words. Wherefore, if I come, I'll remember his deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content there therewith. Again, the reason this man is not, uh, the reason he's doing what he's doing, that he's driven to do what he does, wanting to have the preeminence, wanting to be recognized and received by everybody else except those that are in authority because he's not content. It goes back to being content again. Neither does he himself receive the brethren and forbiddeth them that would and casteth them other. I mean, he's just laying waste to the assembly here because he has a self-centered, self-justified goal 
of wanting people to recognize who he is because he thinks himself something when he's nothing. And again, this can be brother or sister. I oftentimes use it in the male um, male figures because men have more of a tendency to do this than the sisters do. That's why. Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. So John's already describing what the evil is, those that want to have the preeminence. They're not content. They prat against the authority but with malicious words, tearing them down. Um, they don't receive the brethren, and they forbid them that would. They're actually taking control. You know, John has actually said, don't follow this because it's evil, but that which is good. The things we learned of the apostles, the words of our Messiah, what's written in the, uh, the actual word of the Bible. He that doeth good is of Yah, but he that doeth evil hath not seen Yah. Again, he has not the spirit of truth. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 34 through 35. Six, Proverbs 6, 34 and 35. Or jealousy is the rage of a man. So you're going to see somebody that's continually angry, upset about things. And more than likely, he's operating under pretenses and influence of a jealous spirit. Therefore, he will not spare in the day of vengeance. I mean, this is self-motivation. Rage is self-motivation. You will accomplish what you set out to do under the spirit of rage. It's not going to spare in the day of vengeance. It's not going to take anything into account. It's not going to withhold any harsh words from anybody. It's going to speak. Uh, just open up the, the septic tank and just let the you know let it all spew out. This man, he, they're right. Man, it's their day of vengeance. They're going to let it out. He will not regard it as any ransom. Neither will he rest content. Again, here it comes. He won't be content. Though thou givest many gifts, there's nothing you can say. Nothing you can, do, can convince this person that he's operating out of a jealous spirit, that he's full of rage is because he's justified. And I'll tell you what, I wouldn't want to be in the place of that type of attitude, that type of um, jealous and envious, envious spirit where it actually gets to the point of rage, where you have to actually exact your rage and your vengeance on your fellow brother and sister and actually speak those things, which you shouldn't. I mean, I've even had rumors trembling back here of some of the things that our holy sister has been, been called, and it's just damn disturbing, I'll tell you what. I mean, when you start uh, sitting up and addressing the saints, the brothers and sisters, in a certain attitude, you actually place yourself in a judge's position and become a judge of the law. And I'll tell you what, I don't want that judge in return on my head, not for a second. All right, Jude chapter 1, verse 19. Jude 1, 19. These be they who separate themselves. They disunite. They take themselves out, which is a good thing. But why? Why do they do this? You know, it's not telling, there's no telling how many of the people have already been affected by the time this point comes where these people separate themselves. They're sensual, having not the spirit. Um, so how do men separate themselves? Let's take, for instance, again, the spirit of mocker is one which does not agree with or support the whole, but one which seeks to detour men from their work, or whatever that may be, the physical labor, the work in the ministry, um, the edification of the body, whatever it is. It does not have to mean leaving the assembly or going out from the assembly, but it can be done while we are present with the body, talking about those that separate themselves. It doesn't actually have to be a physical removal. We are talking of those which, because of their own lust, separate themselves so that they may do their will and not the will of the whole. One needs to have the spirit in order to be joined into the spirit. For the spirit of the truth is the common thread which binds us and deters us from doing our will and propels us to do the will of the Most High. Um, you know, Take for an instance those who would always rather work alone or unsupervised they then become an island unto themselves with a much lesser degree of accountability. But these same individuals will come into the presence of a united group, all working in the same spirit and seek to disrupt the unity. 
and I'm speaking out of pure experience here, actually relating past experiences to what the Word says, being a first-hand account. I mean, we've had brothers come here again, and uh, again, at Strayaway, we work. We don't sit on our rear ends. We don't have Bible discussions all day long. This pastor says, sit around and and, and, and beat you know beat the scriptures and, and drink coffee or flip scriptures or whatever we're, we're out there we're working with our two hands laboring with our two hands and trying to get this work done and you, you've had brothers in the past here and you'll look and they'll be gone I mean I may have actually had to go knock on doors where I know brothers are staying visitors and say brother you know that's not how we do it here a lot of times we understand that they haven't been with the ministry long. They're still operating after a certain manner. And then we also have to understand that, you know, you have to approach them. If it's 90 degrees out, you have to use common sense and say, look, you know, they, they don't deal with heat every day. Um, there's certain factors. They may have removed themselves. But the point is you still have to let them know within the body to keep the unity, there's accountability. Hey, brother, I'm going here. Brother, I don't feel well. Um, you know, it's just the heat's been too much or my back is hurting, whatever the case may be. Be accountable. Just say, hey, you know, so we know. So the devil doesn't get no, give no place to the devil. He doesn't come in and say, well, this brother just went. But other times, it, it, like I started this out, people will just bail. They'll look around. Uh, there'll be a little stoppage and work. They'll be gone. They'll, they'll take off like that. You go find them sitting behind a computer screen or sitting back up in their house with next to the fireplace, whatever the case may be. And you really try long-suffering to say, no, bro, this is not how we operate. You know, we're all trying to be, the work isn't that tough, and you're not going to die. It's not going to kill you. In fact, it'll make you better and stronger. But, again, it's, it's working through this um, secular, Western, damnable um, upbringings. Hallelujah, but we have hope. Grow weary. Don't grow weary in well-doing. All right, Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. Galatians 5, 19. True, let me see. Uh, 19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are manifest. They're made known. You can actually see them. Which are these? They actually take place. There's an action behind them. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance. Variance is another word for divisions. Emulations, wrath, strife. Again, here we have another word for people causing divisions, whether through debate or you know, bringing up endless genealogies, doting about questions, all these type of things. Seditions, heresies, another one, false doctrine. And envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they that do such things cause variance, cause strife cause addition, emulations. They that do these things shall not inherit the kingdom of Yah. Why? Not in this time and not in the life to come. They can't be a part of it. They actually will remove themselves by operating in this capacity. The word variance, Greek 2054, is a reese of uncertain affinity. It means a quarrel. That is by implication wrangling, contention, debate, strife, variance. So all these synonyms uh, center around the word variance. Um, the works of the flesh our debate, our contention, our quarreling, our wrangling, our strife. And the word strife, the Greek 2052, erythea, uh, means properly intrigued, that is by implication, faction, contentious. You know, a faction is a splinter group or something that's uh, apart from the whole. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 18 and 19. 1 Corinthians 11, 18 and 19. The words of Paul again. For first of all, when you come together in the assembly, you're all together, you're one, you're all in one place, or you're in one spirit, whatever. This is Paul said, man, I hear that there be divisions among you, and Paul says, I partly believe it. So Paul's going to address the belief, why he actually believes that 
what he hears about the divisions. He's not there, but he, he can believe it. He can accept it for what reason? For there must also be heresies among you. The heresies are causing the divisions. That they which are approved may be mad, made manifest among you. Those that are in a position of authority, those that have been approved and ordained to the Most High, can actually come back and manifest and show that these heresies are existing, that they can go to admonish or rebuke who's ever bringing forth these heresies, so these divisions quit. So these things are surfacing so that those that are put in these positions can actually address these items. But the word heresies, the Greek 139, and it's pretty much pronounced like it sounds, heresies. It's from the Greek 138, properly a choice, that is specifically a party or abstractly disunion. So I, I for there must be also disunions among you. Disunification. Heresy is the Greek word itself. Heresy, which is of the Greek word itself. Well, I don't know why that's in there. And it's from the Greek 138. Um, I'll let you pronounce it up there if you want to take a shot at it. Um, to take for oneself, that is prefer. So actually when you're in a her her heretical position or an, uh, walking in that type of manner, um, you actually prefer yourself. You're putting yourself above that, preferring yourself above everybody else. Some of the forms are borrowed from cognate, and they give a crazy history anyway. But it boils down to being causing a disunion. Second Peter 2, chapter 1, no, Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1, and 1 to 3. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. Not meaning that's a past event. It's definitely a present and future event. Who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, bring in disunity, even denying the master that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Now how do we label false prophets and false teachers among us? How are we able to identify the workings of these liars? There are few primary ways. Of course, by the witness of the elders, if they speak not according to those things that are written, and by the warning of the Holy Spirit, but more so by the warning of the Holy Spirit. You know, I say this simply because the devil will oftentimes have to use the truth of the word in order to support the lie of its own prophecy or teaching. It has to use its own revelation to support its teaching, you know, actually has to use the word of um, its own revelate to support its own revelation, if that's making sense. The Trinity is a really good example. You know, they, they use the word, they go back, they take um, from the Bible, they can try to break it down and prove that um, the Trinity is, um, uh, what in the world, just, the word just escaped me. I'm thinking monogamous. What is it? Uh, polytheistic. You know, it, it's three and one. God is three separate gods. No, he isn't. He's one. I mean, we just proved that. I did a blog. My last blog talk. I think I laid that out pretty clearly. Maybe not. Somebody let me know. But if 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 the Messiah was another god, then actually Yah himself would actually be trespassing against his own command by letting another god come before us. If that makes sense. So no, they are one. Uh, and others explaining away entire books from the Bible or attempting to add others. I mean, uh, these are these, these damnable heresies. Uh, Brother Shane did a, a teaching on those attacking the book of Hebrews not too long ago. Uh, you know, because some reason they something enters into these, these people, most of the time men, because they're the ones out there in the forefront, and, and, and they believe for whatever it is, you know, these false teachers um, that, you know, they have to attack certain books of the Bible in order to, you know, show some type of new revelation, to give them some type of scholarly uh, 
whatever title or whatever the case. I'll tell you this much, though. Personally, I don't think I'd even step even close to even uh, even trying to promote the, the books that are, whether they can call them canonized or whatever. You know, the fact of the matter is, if they're there, I'm going to leave them alone because, um, you know, for whatever content they carry, either spiritual, historical, or whatever, they're there. And to actually... Um, make yourself a judge and say this one doesn't belong. You think about the consequences for actually trying to convince people that that doesn't exist. It's not right for whatever reason that you want to deem and come up with. And then you have to stand before the Messiah when he said you don't take away or add anything because you're going to get all the plagues and you're going to get hell on top of it. Man, come on, that's a, that's an awful bold step. And then personally, that's one Elder Becker is not willing to take or even think about taking. So, man, if you want to be Monty Judah and try to destroy the book of Hebrews, have at it. But, uh, hey, buddy, I'm glad I'm not in your shoes. I'm telling you right now. Uh, anyway, um, got carried away there for a minute. Back to verse 2, 2 Peter 2.2. 2. And many shall follow their, follow the false prophets and the false teachers, um, pernicious, or that means damnable ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Again, taking something that's of the truth, written in the book, and turning it around to, for whatever reason, for personal revelation, um, again, back to these damnable heresies, these lying doctrines of men. Um, verse 3, and through covetousness, again, not being content, not having the, the spirit of contentment, but through covetousness, wanting more, um, for themselves, like Diotrephes, wanting to have the self-preeminence, the recognition, whatever the case may be, you know, the whole point is this type of behavior is causing disunity. It's there to disrupt the whole, to infect the mind, to plant the wrong type of seed in the minds of the saints. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, not saying this isn't, this, this is going to happen. This is possible to happen because it's written that it will happen. Whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. <coughs> uh, let me see. Uh, we're going to take and break down the word privily. Um, which verse is that in? Oh, for Pete's sake. Yeah, verse 1. Oh, help me, Jesus. Help me, Messiah. That's right there. All right, the word privily, the Greek 39.19. All right, and that means to introduce, uh, to lead in a side that is introduced surreptitiously. Privily, bring in. Surreptitiously means to introduce underhandedly, secretively, done by stealth, clandestine. So they're not going to go out there and declare this thing in the open. They're going to take these these false teachers and these false brethren or whoever these these people these false prophets that are among us are not going to do these things in the open. They're going to do it in secret, behind the scenes, under the radar. They're going to pull you aside, you know, especially the young ones, the simple ones, because they're not going to do this to those that are learned more so than they will to the younger ones. But the fact is they will do it. They'll sit up in their houses. You get a couple of spiritual brothers together, and they'll start putting out this, you know, well, this is what I heard, and, and this is what I believe, and this is my interpretation. And pretty soon you're going to find yourself continuing in that way or allowing that type of behavior to continue actually in the spirit opposing what's coming out over the pulpit, coming out from the mouth of pastor and the elders and the teachers that Yah has ordained to actually speak to the saints. All right, Isaiah 8:20, Isaiah chapter 8, verses 20 through 22, and just another way to identify um, false prophets and false teachers. To the law and to the testimony, we have these things in front of us. These things that we can go back and actually look and say that this is the truth. If they speak not according to this word, the word of the law and the testimony, it is because there is no light in them. And they shall pass through it 
hardly be dead and hungry. And this shall come to pass that when they shall be hungry, they shall fret themselves. And this is their ultimate end. They shall curse their king and their Yah and look upwards. And they're looking upwards because they're trying to blame the Most High for the position that they're in. But they have actually already put themselves in by bringing in these damnable heresies, these things flying under the radar, these things that may be in the open, trying to change the interpretation of the word by who knows how many different avenues, bringing other things in, you know, uh, other areas. Uh, verse 22, And they shall look unto the earth, and behold, trouble and darkness, dimness of anguish, and they shall be driven to darkness. That's a spiritual, biblical promise. First Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. First Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual. Why? Why couldn't Paul speak to them as unto spiritual? But as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ, with very little understanding, basic language, um, almost a secular type of speech. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it. Neither yet now are you able for ye are yet carnal. Why is Paul telling them they are carnal yet? Why these young babes, um, they can't be fed with meat. They're still on milk. Why can't they come up? Why can't their spiritual understanding be greater? There's a reason. For whereas there is among you envying. Now remember, these are all people of the body. These are all members of the assembly. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions. What, are, what is the result of all these things? Are you not carnal and walk as men? See, that's what that's how men operate. That's why you had, in the time of the Messiah, you had the three sects, or you had the two sects. Some people say three. You had the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You, you had the Nazarenes. You had, uh, you know, the, the different sects in the book of Acts. Why? Uh, is because that they were carnal. They couldn't agree with one another. They, they had their strife, their debate, their contentions. And, of course, ultimately the divisions. I mean, you can look at it in the secular church world. And in Christianity, there's, you know, the, the flavors, the, the different titles. You know, you got the first Baptist, second Baptist. The, I mean, the Baptist itself, you could run your mouth dry trying to pronounce all the different uh, churches out there. First missionary, the missionary of, you know, oh, my God, yeah, they do need help. They need missionaries. I'm telling you, anyway. But this is a, a carnal mindset, introducing envying, strife, uh, and ultimately leading to division or disunity in the body. Acts chapter 15, verses 35 to 30, 39. And um, the reason I'm bringing this in because it's not only um, a product or something that can actually happen to the babes because their understanding isn't there and they need help, but it can also happen to... Um, those that are learned men. And we're going to see right here, Acts chapter 15, verses 35 to 39. And again, um, a lot of it results from uh, people's not being content or be satisfied with the situation or accept or, you know, they, they take their own personal stance, their own viewpoint, and try to inject it into something that's obviously fact and the truth. And they bring about a division. Paul also and Barnabas continued to Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Master with many others. So you have Paul and Barnabas here. They're in Antioch teaching. And some days after Paul, did I give you that uh, chapter 15? Okay, I'm, thank you, Brother Evan. Verse 35 through 39. All right, anyway. And some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, Hey, come on, Barnabas, let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Messiah and see how they do it. See how the seeds we planted affect them, how, how they're doing, how they're um, progressing on by, you know, the words we minister to them. So, you know, these two have been traveling around for a little bit. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. So obviously John, whose surname was Mark, was in the city of Antioch. And Paul thought it not good to take with them. Why? Why did Paul descend from wanting to take um, Mark with Paul and Barnabas because who departed from them from Pamphylia it went not up 
with them to the word. So, I mean, Paul's already basing on a This man has already um, broken unity, broken the accord. He was with them then, but he decided for whatever reason he had something better to do because Paul just got them saying, look, they were going teaching and preaching uh, the word of the Master, the word of the Messiah in all these different cities. And obviously that uh, Mark was with them for a while, but now he ended up in Antioch. And then, come on, Barnabas wants to take him again, but, hey, it, you know, Mark has already proved that he wasn't faithful in the work there. So Paul's like, no way, man. Uh, we already seen his pattern. And he shouldn't have left us. We're all together. We're all union. We're walking in agreement. We're trying to promote the kingdom of the Most High um, to, you know, teach the Gentiles, to open up the understanding of the saints by the Spirit of Yah. And, but here we got Mark. He doesn't want to go to the work. In Pamphylia. So what happened? The contention, the debate, the strife is so sharp between them because they departed the sun or one from another, and so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. Well, we know later on that Barnabas was still in good standing. I don't know. I don't remember recalling uh, Mark later on in Paul's epistles, whose surname was John. It's possibly there. It just escapes me now, but the fact is I know Barnabas was there, but, you know, hopefully Barnabas was finally figured out that it was a mistake that um and hey i'm with paul you know hey, the, the brother wasn't willing to commit himself there how can i trust that he's not going to bail again you know so hey you know paul i believe hey i'm for paul you know hey go paul hallelujah galatians chapter 2 verses 11 through 15 i mean come on think going back to this if anybody witnessed this that they saw this argument they may have seen uh, the result of Mark deciding to go ahead and bail. You know, what, what's that translating? They're doing a good thing here, and then, uh, you know, somebody goes ahead and throws a, you know, a, a, a monkey wrench into the whole thing. So no, no wonder the contention was sharp. But the, the bottom line was it caused a division because somebody went carnal or something. Uh, anyway, Galatians chapter 2, 11 through 15. Galatians 2, 11 through 15. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. Why was he to be blamed? Before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. So look, there's some, somebody coming from James, some group of people, and Peter's in here eating with the Gentiles. But when they were come, James and those that were with him, he withdrew him and separated himself, talking about Peter, fearing them which were of the circumcision, or those that actually were coming with James, those that were of the Hebrew Israelite heritage, already in the natural bloodline. And the other Jews or Yehudians dissembled likewise with him, with Peter, that were all sitting around, insomuch that Barnabas was also carried away with their dissimulation. Man, you got to ask Barnabas, boy, he has trouble in some of that area, don't he? Anyway, but when I saw that they walked not uprightly, this is Paul. I mean, he, he obviously seen that he's, they're causing division because they have this fear working in them. According to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, Thou being a Yehudim, livest after the man of the Gentiles, and not do as the Jews. Why compelst thou the Gentiles to live with the Jews? So if you're, if you're, if you're telling the, the Gentiles, you're telling these new converts, these babes, man, you need to do like you know the, the Hebrew fathers over here, the Hebrew natural Israelites, because they know the law of the Torah, and then you're actually, you know, bailing on the ones you're ministering to. What kind of message does that send? Now, that's going to cause these weak ones to fall away. Who are by Jews by nature, not sinners of the Gentiles? All right, Second Corinthians chapter 6. Um, verses 14 through... 18. Man, I hope I'd make it through. I don't think I only slaughtered for two hours, so I'm being a little bit long-winded tonight. Hallelujah. So I might pick it up a little bit. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Why? There's a reason for it. There's a reason this is commanded. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with, light with darkness? So Paul is asking a question. What concord had Christ with Belial, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel, or an unbeliever? And what agreement hath the temple of Yah with idols? For ye are the temple of the living Yah. The Yah said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their Yah, and they shall be my people. 
Wherefore, come out from among them, and be separate, saith the Master, and touch not the unclean, and I will receive you. Well, I want to go back and focus briefly on the word unequally yoked together, because um, the wording is kind of, you know, kind of confusing a little bit. So at least it is to me. So, I, you know, my own sake, I break these things down to get a better understanding. But why be yoked together at all? No yoke. No, there is no equality in between a believer and unbeliever. But the word of unequally yoked together used in verse 14 appears somewhat out of context with the meaning behind the whole of Paul's admonishment. If we are not to be unequally yoked or tied to an unbeliever, then by implication we should be equally tied to the unbeliever, which of course we know not to be the case if you follow my line of thinking. What Paul is saying is that we who are believers cannot bind or tie ourselves with unbelievers by different measures or standards. Why? Because this unbelief, these unbelieving will actually cause us to, to pick up on their ways. I mean, Yah said way back in the Torah, you mean you stay away from those of other nations, such as using different reasoning or diet idealism in order to include in the body of believers an unbeliever, making concessions to have amongst the believers an unbeliever who you may be fond of. Sure, we do have relations out, of, out in the world, i.e. close co-workers, for example, but we dare not include them in amongst the believers because we believe they are, quote, good people. Jesus said that we are to make friends with unrighteous mammon, or we build a level of trust between you and them, so that in the day when we may fail or become ill or in a way of great need, the unrighteous mammon would invite the believers to abide with them for as long as we may might have need. Not that we are to have the unbelievers come and dwell or yoke together with the saints, the believers. Or how about saying Israeli brother, married or single, attending to take another wife or a wives or wife um, by the Torah? This woman cannot be from outside the twelve tribes. So an Israelite man which desires a woman which is an unbeliever as his wife is trying to take an unbeliever as his wife is attempting to unequally yoke or bind himself to this unbeliever and make his or present her as a believer. Actually, um, well, let me finish reading this. To be unequally yoked is to find justification outside of the word of Yah for one's own desires and ambitions. Pastor speaks of the day when the, the SHTF shit hits the fan, and many of those who were with us in the past may come down to our front gate seeking refuge. The simple fact that they departed in the first place is ample enough proof that they are not of us, so what does this make them? Well, it makes them unbelievers. Whether they be natural blood family, your favorite chum, buddy, pal, after the world, whatever, it will bring disunity to the body by allowing such spirits back in and will offer the great possibility that the Father will not receive or accept us. So if I made any sense at all, being unequally yoked as unbelievers is not making concessions or excuses for those that are not of the faith to actually um, you know, dwell with them to actually allow them to be a part of the fellowship, if that, you know, including your fellowship, your own personal fellowship, because ultimately they're going to wear you down to the point because they haven't got the truth of the Messiah in them and going to lead you away. And, and, and they might, and what, what they may say because you have a fondness and a love for them or whatever it is because you're being unequally yoked, they may cause you to introduce some of their own perverted ideas back into the body whereby others may fall. If that makes sense. Anyway, I hope that did make sense. Verse 18, And I will be a father unto you, and she my sons and daughters, saith the Master Almighty. All right, quickly trying to finish up here in the next about 12 minutes. Acts 4.31 and 32. Acts 4.31, no, wait a minute, I'm sorry. Acts chapter 2, verses 42, 44 through 47. All right, and all that believed were together, not those that were unequally yoked and brought others in, but all that believed were together and had all things common, and sold the possessions of good and part of them to all men as every man had need. And they continued daily. How do they continue? Every day they, with one accord in the temple, they're all together in the same mind, same unity, 
singleness of heart and the same spirit. Um, and with one accord of the temple, breaking bread from house to house, and did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Back to how good and pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell with, to dwell together in union. Bring such a, uh, a, a harmony, such a, an atmosphere of peace and harmony. Praising God and having favor of all the people. And the master added to the assembly daily such as should be saved. Acts chapter 4, verses 31 and 32. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spake the word of Yah with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed, again, the, 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 the annunciation, the, the, the focus is on those that were believed, they were of what? One heart and one soul. Neither said any of them that ought of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. They were content. Um, okay. Let me see. Let me see. A couple more. I'm going to have to quit here. But anyway, the Apostle Paul, when addressing the assembly of Ephesus, wrote to them the reasons that the Most High appoints some certain men to positions within the body. And it is these men which are ordained to make possible those things that are necessary and needful for the whole. Disorder, disunity, and confusion begins to happen when men outside these appointed positions believe themselves to be something other than their nothing. Minister in the same capacity as those are ordained who believe they have the ability and the right to. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 15. Ephesians 4, 11 through 15, going through rather quickly. And he gave some, he gave some, not many, but some, apostles and some prophets and some evangelists, meaning not everybody was an apostle, a prophet, or evangelist. He gave a certain amount to satisfy the needs of the body and some pastors and teachers. Um, and again, i got a footnote here. Sure, we're all ministers. We're able ministers, as the Bible tells us, I believe, in, in the book of Hebrews. But it's in a certain capacity. You know, it's not into a greater measure uh, for a lot of us. It's just that we have the ability to witness the words of truth, the words of the Messiah, the words that bring life. But Yah gives these certain men, and these men, not no women, these men, a greater uh, deepness of uh, the, the spiritual gift, the spiritual understanding, the spiritual wisdom to expound on Yah's people to, you know, exhort the saints. Verse 12, for why, why does Yah give us these men? Not everybody, just these some men. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we, what? What is the, what is the intended reason that these men are ordained, raised up, put in our midst, these ones that are ordained, anointed the Most High, set in these positions. They were content where they were, and then Yah raised them up in these positions for this reason, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till what? Till we all come in the unity of the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of Yah unto the, a perfect man, under the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ that henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, and what? What causes us to and fro? And carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of who? Men. And the cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth and love may grow up into all things, up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Let me see, what do I got? Who ain't going to make it? Uh, let me go to this one. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. Uh, this is Paul again, the words of Paul. I therefore, the prisoner of the Master, beseech you that you walk worthy of the calling wherewith you are called of the vocation, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering forbearing one another in love, endeavoring, endeavoring, that is to make an effort, to be prompt, to be earnest, to be diligent, to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace by whatever measure, in the bond of the unity, the oneness, unanimity, is that how they say it? The unity, 
um, uh, to keep it in in the spirit, in the bond of peace. Okay, I'm going to give you, if you got a pen and piece of paper, you can write these down, and this would, you know, the, the conclusion of the study, I kind of skipped to the end, but if I get a second. All right, I think I'm going to try and get these in here quick, just a couple more. All right, to be in one, to, to be one in spirit, in the will of the Most High, we must hold the line about speaking only according to the word. Debate, disagreements, confusions are a result from men seeking to speak their own words and revelations of what they deem to be the truth. Jesus said many times that he only spoke those things which were given him by the Father. The Messiah did not deviate from the rule, regardless of what he may have thought or seen. And as I was talking about that, the words of our own revelation, I think Paul, where did he talk about that? Um, it's in Corinthians, it slips on mind right now, but he's in chapter 14, I think it is, where he talks about, you know, how is it that when every one of you come together, you, you have a revelation, and you have your own little, you know, your story, your word. I don't remember how the verse goes, but I do remember it says in there your own revelation, you know, and all this is not to the edification for the body. Stick to the word. Jesus said, John 15, 15, Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his master doeth, but I have called you friends. Why? For all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Meaning Jesus just, uh, you know, saying again, he spoke the things that were given to him by the Father. He didn't come up with his own plan. All right, John chapter 8. I'm going to have to end on this one because it's quite lengthy. John chapter 8, verses um, 25 through 28, and then 38 through 45. All right, verse 25. Then they said unto him, Who art thou? These are the, um, quote, the scribes, the Pharisees, the hypocrites, questioning the Messiah again. You know, who art you? And Jesus said unto them, even the same that I said unto you from the beginning, from the very onset of this, when you start to question who I was. I have, I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. They understood not that he spake to them of the Father. Then said Jesus unto them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. I speak that which I have seen in my Father, and you do that which you have seen of your Father. You know, what the scribes, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees speak of. They're made-up traditions, their own prescribed inventions of the way of holiness. Uh, you know, the Talmud, this is one such traitorous piece of work, you know. There are some that say that the Messiah actually quoted the Talmud. But if what in anything, these, those dens of thieves, they, these, these imposters took the words of the Messiah, they added them to their own corrupt writings in only order to gain some type of credibility. And that's what I see about the books like the Talmud and all this other you know, garbage, these inventions of men to make themselves appear holy. From such things turn away. First John... Uh, well, I, that was verse uh, 38. I'm sorry, I got mixed up. John chapter 8, I'm on verse 38, going to 39 and ending on 45. Sorry about the confusion. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto him, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But you now you seek to kill me, a man, and have told you the truth, which I have heard of God. Yah, this did not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father. Then they said unto him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even Yah. Jesus said unto them, If Yah were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from Yah, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why all this is happening? Why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? The bottom line, you are of your father the devil, and less of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and both not in the truth, because... There is no truth in him. Because there is no truth in him, he can't speak it. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, which is the word of Yah, you believe me not. All right, I'm going to have to end there.
Um, sorry we run out of time, but anyway, I sure hope you all enjoyed tonight's broadcast um, and, and got something out of it. Um, again, just be careful of the workings of the spirit of disunity. It's there. It's, it's devices are manifest. They are clearly seen. And let me ask you this. Am I still on the air? How, can you all still hear me? Okay, great. All right. I thought my time had expired. Anyway, anyway, we'll, we'll, we will end there. And, uh, again, um, okay, appreciate it. I'm still on the air. Hallelujah. Anyway, um, yeah, watch out for these workings of the spirit of disunity. Obviously, you know, unfortunately, they will arise. Um, things, situations are going to happen, um, you know, and, uh, you know, we just have to deal with them. And unfortunately, um, you know, you, you can do yourself a big favor by, you know, when, when this stuff arises, we're proven on the spot or deal with it if it looks like it's, you know, getting out of hand, whatever the case may be. But don't allow yourself to get caught up in a, in a situation or circumstance where you might actually cause somebody else to, um, you know, enter in a state of debate or strife or cause them to be discontent or whatever the case may be. Because, you know, the devil, he's a, a formidable foe, an adversary. And he's obviously not going to waste any, uh, any uh, you know, any, any open door or anything that, um, you know, would offer the possibility of the cause this disunity in the body. Um, and, of course, you know, y'all keep uh, Pastor Corey continuing this prayer tonight. I don't know where they are, if they're still continuing, if they're hot in the middle of it. But anyway, you know, it's it's uh, I keep them up in prayer regardless because he is one of the shepherds in Israel. And, of course, you know, the other pastors, and, and especially Pastor Dowell, um, you know, as, as he brings forth the word, and we've been getting fed a wonderful, wonderful meals of, you know, just the word that, you know, is it should be enlightening to the soul, should be deliverance and freedom from, um, you know, the, the, uh, the oppression of the devil, um, should actually be causing and bringing more unity into the body as we, you know, as, as pastor and the elders and the teachers are, um, you know, bringing more of this to the light and uncovering more of these hidden works and, re, you know, uh, revisiting some of the things in the past and just, you know, shedding more light on them. Um, anyway, y'all be blessed. Oh, hey, I got to let you. I got to let you in. On, I was meditating this morning before, um, uh, before Sabbath service, and I came up with a pretty good I thought it was pretty clever, but I usually don't share all these clever thoughts, but I thought this was pretty good, you know. But I've been, I've been dealing with somebody on, on one of the comment sections about, you know, that this person presents themselves as, you know, of course, they they totally hate you and whatever the case may be, but you can feel that there's some type of homosexual spirit there. But anyway, I got this thought, you know, and, and there's this phrase that the homosexuals are coming out of the closet, the lesbians, the faggots, you know, the, the bisexuals, all the immoral sexual practices are being open. But the fact of the matter is, is the only reason they're coming out of the closet because somebody opened the damn door. You know, that's all these people that, you know, the advocates, the voices for whether they're in the practice or not, it's those that actually take pleasure in those that do such things are the ones that are actually turning the knob and opening up the door. So if these fools hadn't have done that, I think a lot of these devils would have still stayed in the closets. But, hey, it's a personal revelation. I'm not trying to cause disunity. I just thought I'd share that. Anyway, <laughs> hallelujah, all streams open. Uh-oh, look at him looking. <laughs>